And for this session will be offered by Olina Karitonova, member of Grevio, the monitoring body of the Istanbul Convention, Council of Europe. Uh, she's also an advisor to the Minister of Education and Science of Ukraine on ensuring equal rights and opportunities for women and men. She's a qualified lawyer with more than 20 years of experience in research and teaching activities and a member of several working groups and associations for women's rights. Olena, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. The floor thank is yours. You. Could I use my presentation, please? Yeah, I could uh, press this one. Ah, thank you, thank you very much. Dear organizers, dear participants, thank you very much for the invitation to attend this very important conference and to do the exchange of our opinions, of our thoughts. In preparation uh, to uh, for this event, I thought about the topic of the panel and tried to find out of how the commitment, commitment, uh, commitments toward gender-based violence at international level is connected with the commitment to the ideas of gender equality and how this commitment is ensured. And I have found four features that character characterize the commitment. There are probably more, but that's what I have been able to capture at the moment. So I can name now the following. Continuity, rhizomality, desired cooperation, and global openness. So continuity is a very important feature of the commitment. For example, when we talk about such an important legal instrument for combating gender-based violence as the Istanbul Convention, it is significant to emphasize that it did not arise out of nowhere. It was the result of the consistent development of human rights. It ensures continuity, preserves the achievements of human rights that already exist, and continues the movement towards the evolution and development of those rights. This evolutionary approach to the interpretation of human rights is directly enshrined in the European Convention of Human Rights, in particular in its preamble. And we can see the same approach in the Istanbul Convention, where, which in practical terms contributes to this evolution. It provided for a new standard for the protection of victims of gender-based violence, the highest level of protection. The explanatory report to the Istanbul Convention underlined that the Convention harmoniously coexists with other treaties. And the drafters especially stressed that the main aim of the Convention is to strengthen the protection for victims by assuring them of the highest level of protection. The word highest here is important. I can be, it can be argued that approach provided the higher protection should prevail in this way, the European Convention of Human Rights constitutes Lex Generalis in the context of violence against women, while the Istanbul Convention constitutes Lex Specialis as the law specifically dealing with the violence across the Council of Europe. Uh, and if in the legal framework of the European Convention it was necessary to prove the discriminatory nature of certain norms or, or practices, the framework of the Istanbul Convention is built on the important methodological legal basis that a violence against women is understood as a violation of human rights and a form of discrimination against women in Article 3. And therefore, such forms of violence considered as a form of discrimination straightforwardly without any need of such proofs. The preamble to the Istanbul Convention explicitly recognizes that violence against women is a manifestation of historically unequal power relations between women and men, which have led to domination over and discrimination against women by men to, and to the prevention of the full advancement of women. This is a crucially important point of understanding on which the entire system of the Istanbul Convention is built. Gender-based violence is the extreme manifestation of gender inequality. It is directly rooted, directly rooted in it. The main idea of Istanbul Convention is that by reducing gender inequality, you can reduce the level of gender-based violence because it works like the law of connected vessels the greater the gender inequality, the higher risk of gender-based violence.
Illustrative here is the case of Turkey, which was one of the first to sign and ratify the convention, but which was unable to establish a stable connection between gender equality and opportunities for women and the combat against gender-based violence. Indeed, Turkey took uh, some effective steps by adopting the law which provided a more efficient response to gender-based domestic violence. But at the same time, the Turkish political establishment took legal and political initiatives which seriously jeopardized women's inequality. And as a result, Turkey became the first state to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention. The lack of Turkey's sincerity in its political commitment to address gender-based violence caused the withdrawal. And here it is worth emphasizing another evolutionary point in the general recommendation of SIDA number 35, uh, in 2013, it was adopted. It is stressed that the recognition of gender-based violence as a form of discrimination is a principle of international customary law. The growing body of case law of the European Court of Human Rights, which taking into account the Istanbul Convention, also contributes to the creating of a gender-sensitive reading of the European Convention. For example, in the case of, the, um, of Volodina versus Russia, Russia did not ratify the Istanbul Convention, but was still a member of the Council of Europe at the time of the case. The court referred to Istanbul Convention and highlighted the general recommendation number 35 of the CEDA committee in its argumentation. So here we can observe the phenomenon of cross fertilization, which creates a favorable ground for commitment to the principle of gender equality. And I would like to illustrate the dynamics of approaches to complex issues in education, which also have a gender profile, using the example of two cases, Handicide versus United Kingdom. It was the first case where the court discussed the margin of appreciation. The court examined whether the forfeiture of the Little Red School book, it was a reference book for school children, containing a section concerning sex on grounds of obscenity, violated the right to freedom of expression under Article 10 of the Convention. The European Court of Human Rights stated that Article 10 gives member states a margin of appreciation and there is no violation in this case. I would like to add that in 2014, the government did allow a censored edition to be published in the United Kingdom. The publisher, Martin Wagner, who was reissuing uh, the book, said he took legal advice and was told the ban was now outdated. Oh, sorry. The next case. Uh, versus Switzerland in 2018 about the compulsory sex education in um, Basel Primary School refused to grant uh, Miss Ars requested that her daughter, that uh, then aged seven, be exempted from sex education lessons. And as to the compliant under Article 8, the court recognized that the application of some of the A's pursued by sexual education provided for minor children might be controversial. However, one of the aims of sex education was to prevent sexual violence and exploitation, which posed a real threat to the physical and mental health of children and against which children of all ages had to be protected. Correlated with this position of the court is the baseline evalu evaluation report of Gravio regarding Ireland, published a few days ago, where Gravio draws attention to some special features of the Irish educational system, which in Gravio's view can have a bearing on the teaching of the principles and topics required uh, under Article 14 about the education of the Istanbul Convention. Primary and post-primary schools in Ireland are not managed directly by the state, but by a private patron. The management boards of the schools are required to carry out their functions in accordance with the policies established by the Minister of Education, but they are also required to uphold the cultural, moral, religious, and spiritual values, values of the patron, otherwise called the ethos. Parents can decide to withdraw their children from the teaching of a given topic if it is contrary to their conscience. Greville considers that the respect of the right to freedom of religion or belief should be balanced with the need to protect children from sexual violence. Indeed, sexual education is a preventive action that is crucial to raise children's awareness of this form of violence and protect them from harm. 
at the same time, the growing attention to the security argument and the strengthening of securitization processes leads some researchers to worry about the balance between the shield and sword functions performed by human rights. Francoise Stulkens, Christine van de Wingard are widely known with the reference to an opposition between the shield function and the sword function of human rights. And in short, human rights have both a defensive and an offensive role, and a role of both neutralizing and triggering the application of criminal law. And at last time, we can observe the growing up of offensive role. Some of scholars even talk about the phenomena of carceral feminism and growing tensions accumulated in the criminal justice sector. And on my view, we can diffuse this tension and find the balance between the functions shifting the accents on such a component of gender equality as transformative equality, because regarding to it, we prevent the gender violence working with its roots. And here I turn to the analysis of such a feature of the commitment to the principle of gender equality as rhizomality. In human culture, the tyranny of the flower existed for a long time. We always adm admired the beauty of the flower and the roots were not given due attention. So the marginalization of the roots took place. However, the rhizome uh, image refers us precisely to the image of the root this powerful network system, the key qualities of which are the ability to endless variations, self-organization, constant creative mobility through which new meanings sprout. Through this lens of rhizomality, I would like to look at the cultural and social stereotypes that gendering our behavior, our pain, and how legal regulation at the international level proposes to work with these things. If you look at Article 5 of the CEDO, we see that states' parties shall take all appropriate measures to modify the social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women with a view to achieving the elimination of prejudices, outcustomary, and all other practices which are based on the idea of the inferiority of the superiority of either of the sexes or on stereotyped roles for men and women. This provision is intervened like a rhizome with the root system of the Istanbul Convention, where emphasis is placed on the need to implement the combat against stereotypes through education. Parties shall take where appropriate the necessary steps to include teaching material on issues such as equality between women and men, non-stereotype gender roles, mutual respect, non-violent conflict resolution in interpersonal relationships, gender-based violence against women and the right to personal integrity, adapted to the involving capacity of learners in formal curricula and at all levels of education. Parties shall take the necessary steps to promote the principles referred to in paragraph 1 in informal educational facilities as well as in sports, cultural and leisure facilities and the media. And according to this, the understanding the essence of the problems faced by women at the level of informal practices is very important. Macroaggression or small incidents can build up and cause a snowball effect and alienate women from the academy. For example, it could be hiding of common resources, lack of information, exclusion from informal networks, ignoring people in meetings, lack of links to publications, conversion to less prestigious duties, etc., etc. None of these factors alone forces women out. But these episodes tend to accumulate and this leads to the fact that the partly women can be pushed out of the academy, partly they break out on their own, and quite often their stories combine both options. Small interactions that may seem innocent on their own could be a picture of gender bias and discrimination. The problem is that such processes are the bottom of the iceberg, are hidden uh, and invisible, and are more often perceived as an individual problem of a person who is pushed out of withdrawn from the competition of the way, on the way to the top. They try to describe the problems of the system as individualized and pretend that problems don't exist. But in fact, meritocracy is a big myth. 
That is why it is very important to understand how the educational and working environment and organizational culture are formed and what factors make an influence on the women's path. Of course, integration of gender-sensitive approaches to curricula, attention to the problems of an invisible curriculum and invisible classroom, training on gender-sensitive academic staff, structural changes at the level of decision-making in educational management, more balanced gender representation could help in this situation. The next uh, feature of gender commitment, what I mentioned, is a desired cooperation. I mean that the cooperation of interested parties is a good example of how joint efforts lead to a result. We know that several concepts have been used by researchers to describe the feminist coordination that seeks to affect the policy process. Among them are strategic partnerships, triangles of empowerment, feminist advocacy coalitions, well, the triangle, uh, triangles may be the most famous concept by Woodward. Even if these feminist cooperative uh, constellations are usually located in the margins of institutional male power, coordinated agency may compensate for the lack of attention and influence encountered in the political and policy process. These are examples of how cooperation led to strengthening of gender equality and increased commitment to it. And the fourth feature is global openness. On slide you see this articles 75 and 76 of the Istanbul Convention. It contains the provisions about that not only member states could be member states of Council of Europe could be the members of the Istanbul Convention, but also not member state which um, um, participated in elaboration of of the. Uh, convention could be um, also the parties and also um, the member parties could invite uh, other other uh, non membership non member states to the uh, joining to the convention uh, and uh, now we periodically hearing about uh, the need of new women rights treat treaty and I suppose that at this stage Initiatives for a new universal treaty on women's rights lead to the proliferation of existing efforts. Because the potential of Istanbul Convention is far from exhausted, and the principled global openness is an important signal to all countries of the world who would like to join this agreement, which has a dual nature, the Treaty of International Cooperation and the Treaty on Human Rights. We remember that the university means the universe and that thanks to the openness of knowledge and to network of the first universities, the first European Renaissance emerged. Similar to this, the open global legal dialogue on women's rights can lead to the prosperity of societies and the development of human capital. And we remember also the concept of the third mission of universities, which originated in Northern Europe. The university is not only responsible for qualifying the human capital, education, the first mission of university, and for producing new knowledge, research as the second mission, and the university is serving the society. And the third mission of universities could be defined as a set of specific actions and capabilities that leads to the benefit of society. In this sense, supporting gender equality and combating, combating gender-based violence, I am on the cornerstones of the modern mission of university. And finalizing my presentation, I would like to use a metaphor from the movie Legends of the Fall. If you have not seen, I, I could recommend it. Julia Ormond was starring in this movie, where they say about the main character, she was like the water that freezes inside the rock and breaks it apart. If we turn the live nourishing water of gender equality into ice, we will destroy the rock on which a modern decent society rests. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I'd like now to, to call on Anne Pippa from the European Commission.